What are some of the most common mistakes that you see when someone is entering a fat loss stage or they're trying to reduce their adipose tissue? Gotcha. Okay. Well, first of all, a lot of people just try to eat less calories, right? They're like, I'll just, you know, cut my portions down. I'm eating the same stuff I was eating before, but I'm going to just eat half as much. Instant fail due to hunger. <laughs> like everyone's eating to satiety. You're already eating to satiety of the food you're eating now. So if you just try to cut everything in half, you're going to be starving out of your mind immediately. So just like portion size or I'm going to eat less of the same stuff is an epic fail. I've also found that when people cut back on their calories, what basically everybody's eating until they get enough protein. So if you cut back on your calories and you're cutting back on your protein grams at the same time, again, you're going to be hungry. So you can't just cut back on calories. You have to cut back on carbs and fats specifically and keep all the protein there. You know what I mean? So you have to, you have to eat just as much protein as you were eating before, but you have to have the same level of satiety that you had before. And so the, you really have to focus on what you're eating instead of how much you're eating. And that's probably the biggest fail that I see. There's a bunch of other ones though, <laughs> intermittent fasting. So like people try to, they'll be like, oh, well, I'll just go a super long time without eating. But that's great. But that has an expiration date and then you're starving out of your mind and you still haven't learned what you should eat when you're eating and you're going to be so hungry that you might just eat a whole jar of peanut butter and then you're right back to where you started so people will just gain and lose and gain and lose and gain and lose the same five pounds over and over again by trying to over leverage intermittent fasting intermittent fasting can be a tiny bit beneficial layered on top of already knowing what to eat but if you just have a monofocal over-reliance in intermittent fasting, that's going to be an instant fail. Yeah. But those are, those are some of the, the bigger ones that I could think of. Yeah. And I think that this warrants diving a little bit into the protein leverage hypothesis. I think what you just said there sort of alluded to it when people just cut their calories in half, they're going to be cutting everything by half, or even if it's just 20% or 30%, you're going to reduce everything, including your protein by 20 or 30%, which is going to necessitate, like you're going to continue to search for those calories. So just take a moment for uh, my listeners who are not familiar with that to explain what the protein leverage hypothesis is and why what you just said, which is cutting back on all calories, total calories is not a great idea when we're thinking about fat loss. Gotcha. Gotcha. So this whole protein leverage thing was discovered by professors Rabenheimer and Simpson down in Australia. And these guys, I mean, I tried to give them the Nobel prize for this discovery, but it turns out I can't give out Nobel prizes. So <laughs> you can send them a lovely it. note. Yeah. Exactly. They, <laughs> emotionally, I'm giving them a Nobel prize for this. They realized that uh, across all animal species, there's this protein leverage phenomenon where animals will eat until they get enough protein. And this is conserved from like insects up to, you know, birds and fish and mammals and humans, of course, because we're just like giant animals that talk. So pretty much you're eating until you get enough protein and only then are you going to stop eating. And protein dilution, when you dump a bunch of refined carbs and refined fats into the food supply, you end up eating the same amount of protein, but you have to overeat carbs and fats to get there. It's like your grandparents just killed a chicken and ate the whole thing, but you go through the drive through and get chicken nuggets. And in order to get the same amount of protein from chicken nuggets that you got from chicken, you have to uh, massively overeat a trillion calories from breading and oil and all these refined carbs and refined fats that were added. And that's how protein leverage works. You're going to eat until you get enough protein. So you can either just eat that chicken and be done or basically just be eating your body weight in chicken nuggets all day long. And right. that's protein leverage, uh, you know, in a nutshell. And I think it's it's very useful for my audience, typically perimenopausal and menopausal women, like somewhere between 35 and 55 years of age, trying to figure out why their body composition is changing despite doing the same things that they've always done. You know, they're accumulating more of that ectopic fat distribution centrally. Maybe they're seeing changes in muscle mass, changes in strength, changes in power, despite doing the same thing that they've always done. So I think that this is an important point when we're trying to, from a nutritional perspective, think about what are some of the ways that we want to accelerate or optimize fat loss, not just weight loss, but fat loss. It's to have it, you know, to pull protein out of the, let's say total percentage of what, you know, total percentage of calories that you're eating per day and make it a gram target. So irrespective of the calories that you're eating, whether it's 
1800 calories, 1500 calories, whatever 100 calories, there's still a protein target that is being reached ir irrespective of total calories. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, right. Uh, that's exactly how it works. You're, you, you, you're going to eat a certain amount of protein. So if you go out of your way to target that first and eat higher protein percentage foods, you're basically just going to eat less downstream calories. And uh, so protein awareness, protein prioritization, really, really important. Most people are blissfully unaware that any of this is even remotely going on. So yeah, yeah it's kind of a big deal. Uh, I, I agree. It's kind of a big deal. Yeah. And to your point around intermittent fasting, this is an area where I've changed my mind on. So I used to write a lot and talk a lot about intermittent fasting for women and doing it aggressively so. And now as a woman myself in perimenopause, and I'd love for you to speak to, you know, my original question was common fat loss mistakes. I would like us to sort of break out that category of perimenopausal and menopausal women, because as a natural function of aging, we are naturally more and more catabolic. You know, you're, you know, we might be lifting all the weights, but we just are, you know, that catabolism, whether it's osteoclasts, whether it's net muscle protein synthesis, it, it, it's harder to get ahead of it as we age. And so this intermittent fasting, this idea that you might fast until noon or one o'clock. Or I know that there are a lot of individuals online who talk about like OMAD, like one meal a day or 24 hour fasts as a gut reset, as a hormone reset, whatever. This is where I now disagree with that for women. I think that if you are going to fast, it should, at least my opinion, and feel free to redirect me or tell me what your, what your thoughts are on this, is you can still fast. Like we all fast every day, we're all sleeping, but it should be much gentler. It should be sort of a intermittent fasting light. And I would much prefer you to have almost like a phasic shift where you're eating earlier in the day, like you're eating upon waking. So you're sort of breaking that, you know, catabolism that's happening overnight to the muscle tissue. And then maybe if you, if you want to fast for a longer period of time, like you cut off your evening calories as you're going into sleep. Right, right, right. Absolutely. So like the, the concept of uh, this U-shaped curve with intermittent fasting, where, you know, just eating every second of your entire day would probably be a little too frequent. But then, you know, let's be absurd and say, I'm only going to eat once a week, once a month, once a year. You can kind of see that it's obvious that there's a u-shaped curve with a sweet spot for eating frequency and such a thing as too frequent and not frequent enough so i like a, a light intermittent fast i think by the time you shrunk all the way down to one meal a day you've gone past optimal and you're sliding into suboptimal so i you know i like a, just a sort of a light 16 8 for most people if i just had to prescribe one regimen to the whole planet just you know in general it would be a 16 8 which is just a light intermittent fast where you're fasting just enough to get really in touch with hunger and fullness and you're cutting down on snacking and you're kind of partitioning at your day into eating and not eating a little bit but you're not just shrinking it all the way down to one meal a day and yeah. getting overly hungry overly catabolic and that sort of thing so yeah intermittent fasting lightly beneficial but only to a certain point you it doesn't scale you can't leverage it harder and you you just layer that on top of already knowing what to eat and eating the right things it's something that nobody has to do anyone who's successful with their diet could take what they're eating and break it into 10 meals and eat eat it throughout their waking day and not intermittent fast at all and if they're eating the exact same foods they're going to have the exact same outcome basically so it's not it's nothing that anyone has to do but i do find it lightly beneficial when people are just eating to satiety like most of us are because you get a little more in touch with hunger and fullness you get a little more fat adapted you get a little better at operating without having to constantly refuel your liver glycogen by just grazing on snackable carbs all day long if you know right. what i mean right. so so there's some benefits there there you know, not essential. I think they're valuable a little bit, but you really want to pitch it right in the middle of this U-shaped curve, which is going to be, you know, two or three meals a day, a 16-8, that kind of thing. <laughs>